Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us to this session of uh, LVFlow webinar. Today, we will be talking about microfluidic contact lenses in ocular diagnostic by uh, Rosalia Moredu. Uh, I would like to remind you that this uh, webinar will be recorded and that will, it will last around 15 minutes. And then we'll have a 15 minutes Q&A session where you can ask any questions you can have. If following this, uh, you have any more questions for us, feel free to reach out at contact at lbflow.com. Rosalia, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody, and thanks, Roban. Welcome all to this webinar. Uh, so my name is Rosalia, and uh, I am finishing my PhD at uh, Imperial College London, and I founded a startup recently of which we will disclo disclose uh, more information in the upcoming weeks. And I have a background in biomedical engineering and nanotechnology. Uh, so this webinar will be structured as follows. So we will first go through uh, speaking a bit about the tear fluid, why it's interesting, what's its origin. Uh, then we will move to investigate the different type of contact lenses and their materials uh, from which we will depend which technology we use to fabricate micro channels within contact lenses. And then we, we will move to the applications, some of the applications of these devices. Uh, so tears are one of the most easily accessible body fluids, which covers the surface of our eyes. They are made 98% of water and they uh, are secreted by the lacrimal gland and the my myobia glands. They can be divided in three main layers. So a lipid layer, an equus layer and a mucin layer, which is uh, the one interface in the cornea. Uh, tears, apart from water, they... Uh, they also contain a bunch of other, uh, of other analytes like electrolytes, the most represented of which are displayed in this slide, uh, proteins and lipids. And uh, most of them were found to be, uh, uh, to be actually related to the health status of an individual in both ocular and systemic conditions. Uh, so here I show a bit of uh, a few disease that find their biomarkers in tears such as dry eye, for example, which is displayed here. All these diseases are, are normally uh, diagnosed in a reactive way, so after clear symptoms appear, uh, whereas by using biomarkers, we may aim to have uh, preventive uh, medicine. So we will be able to diagnose diseases earlier and um, basically prevent uh, surgeries and uh, another thing that we will discuss later. Here we have a picture of glaucoma, which is the le leading cause of blindness globally. And here so some example of keratopathies, such as keratoconus and keratoglobus, which are the, the most uh, usual manifestations where the cornea gradually turns into a conical shape or into a spherical extrusion. Tears also find, um, they have been found to contain also markers related to systemic disease, like multiple sclerosis, breast cancer, and neurodegenerative disease like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Who actually collects their tears and why they do it? Uh, so tears, there are some um, people with, uh, with ocular disease or at risk of developing them who have like for a fa family history, for example, of ocular disease and they usually get their tear screens one per year, just like most people do with blood. So the gold standards for tear fluid collection are the Schirmer's test, which is basically consists in inserting a paper strip in the lower eyelid of the patient, leaving it there for two, three minutes, and then uh, tears will be collected in the uh, paper uh, and extracted from there, frozen at minus 80 degrees to prevent protein from denaturation and then um, will be sent to a laboratory for, uh, for, for screening, for analysis. Uh, this method, as you can imagine, despite being the most common, is, uh, induces high, uh, high level of contaminations from the paper, from the environment, from the fact that it induces local irritation in the eye that has been found to change the tear composition at a specific point. But still, it is the, the most used one. This method is also used to, di uh, to diagnose dry eye disease, which is a disease affecting like the 20% of the population globally, uh, where there is a, either an insufficient tear production or a high evaporation rate of the tears. This is another method that uses a tube uh, made of plastic or glass uh, of a similar fashion, but is used only for sampling and not for dry eye disease diagnostics. 
Uh, so just to give a little bit of, of information for the background, this may seem like a niche field uh, at the beginning, but actually ophthalmology is one of the busiest specialties in England, for, for example, providing over 7.5 million outpatients appointment per year and over half a million surgical procedures, which could be avoided if diseases were, for example, diagnosed earlier. Uh, it is one of the less tech enabled as we saw earlier, even just for the sampling method. And methods, the diagnostic methods are based on observation of the eye mainly. So prevention is not encouraged also because the few machineries uh, that are there, they may be only operated by clinicians. Uh, whereas contact lenses are a very popular device that uh, lays, stays in, di in direct contact with eye tissues, uh, which can, may provide real-time continuous monitoring to measure both tear fluid parameters, so the um, uh, tear components, as well as ocular surface parameters like pressure, temperature, tear volume, etc. And tears, a, a nice way to uh, uh, handle these tears in the lens could be, for example, to use microfluidics in lenses. So this was the main reason why uh, we were interested in this field. Uh, so before jumping into the microfluid technology, I wanted just to give a brief background about which contact lenses are there out, out there in the market. So the most common of them are the soft lenses that most, pe most people use. They are made of so soft polymers, hydrophilic polymers like polyhema as a core polymer. Then we have rigid contact lenses, which are uh, made of rigid gas permeable uh, materials. They are called RGP contact lenses. And uh, these materials uh, aim to emulate the mechanical and optical properties of PMMA uh, while allowing uh, gas to go through the lens to allow the eye to breathe. These rigid lenses are worn by a certain slice of the population um, who has specific eye problems and they come in different uh, sizes. Uh, so, before, uh, so when uh, wanting to obtain some micro channels within a lens, of course, uh, the method we use will depend on, on this material. So soft lenses are mainly lab made. The, uh, my, so microfluidic soft lenses are usually lab made due to the fact that there is no method to, mo to modify an existing soft contact lenses, commercial contact lenses, and they are usually fabricated by soft lithography. This is the main technology. Rigid lenses may be uh, parched uh, and then uh, ablated with a laser to etch some, some micro channels, so commercial lenses can be used. Uh, let's go through the soft contact lenses first. So uh, here, uh, soft lithography, traditional method, but in card uh, surfaces, this is the only uh, main difference. So we have <clears throat> a mold that uh, features the reverse of the pattern that you want to have in the lens. Then some polymer like polyhema is poured over the mold and then cured and uh, further peeled off to obtain the shape. So this is one of the results. Uh, two pieces may be fabricated and then bonded to close the, the channel. And uh, these channels were used, for example, to, the, to find out the pH in tears, so for tear pH measurements um, within the lens with a colorimetric method. So we can see a CD pH and basic pH. Uh, so another interesting uh, example about uh, using uh, soft lithography to fabricate microfluidic lenses um, is uh, in the application of pressure sensors, so to measure the ocular pressure in glaucoma, for example. So in this case, uh, this disc was obtained by uh, uh, fabricating two pieces, so the top piece and the bottom piece featuring some, some micro channels with this geometry. Uh, these devices as uh, displayed here. So we can see a liquid reservoir, a sensing channel, and an air reservoir. Uh, so how it works is displayed here in the top right. So we can see that upon expansion, we have the liquid entering the channel. So the liquid will climb up in the channel. And upon release, air will enter the channel. So the liquid will go down. This disc was, um, and this is a pressure sensor. So the, uh, based on pressure, the liquid is an oil. Uh, so it's not tears, tears are not involved here. It's just the whole device that features a liquid by itself, which is a, an oil that was found to induce the less hysteresis. 
and this disk was then integrated into a PDMS lab-made contact lens. Uh, this lens was then uh, uh, fi uh, was fi finally tested in an ex vivo uh, pig eye by using a needle, uh, which was uh, uh, then connected to a OB1 pressure generator by L flow. This one displayed here that would allow to control the pressure uh, at very small ranges. So in the range of interest between 10 and 30 millimeters of mercury, which is the range of pressure we are interested in monitoring in the eye. And here we, we can see from these images and from this video as well. Okay, uh, so basically what happens here in this video is that uh, they change the, the pressure and we, we can observe in, in real time that 15 millibar, the, the liquid is here in this point. Then they reduce the pressure, it goes down they increase the pressure, it goes up. So there is a visual method to establish the, to read out the pressure. Uh, we, we can observe the same in, in this picture. So P0, we have uh, liquid here. P1, increased pressure, the liquid is here. They go back to P0 and we find the liquid here again. Uh, so going back to the same uh, screen, now we move to rigid lenses, which main technology is laser ablation. So uh, this is a very uh, well-known technology in general. So it basically consists on using a laser to etch away some material from a, from a surface. Uh, there are, of course, different types of lasers like CO2 laser, UV laser, femtosecond laser, etc., which differ for, uh, from their specifics. So beam spot, therefore, uh, minimum resolution that can be achieved. Uh, but they all share the same workflow, which is um, uh, designing a specific pattern uh, on a design software and then uh, printing it out on the lens in this case. So here we can see a spiral microchannel that was obtained by a femtosecond laser and we can uh, see the minimum feature which is the width of the microchannel is 100 micrometers. Uh, so it, we can see that it uh, allows to, to fabricate clean, clean channels and structures. And then of course the channel is open when uh, the material is etched away. So it needs to be uh, closed by, um, uh, for example, fabricating a polyheme, a lab-made contact lens, uh, using a real contact lens as a mold and bo bonding it on top to uh, close the system. This simple lens, which is like a su uh, super simple device that can be fabricated really quickly, is already a good alternative, could be a good alternative to uh, these methods we saw, both for tear sampling, so just wearing the lens and the liquid flows in the channel and then uh, it's a sterile way to collect tears, as well as for dry eye diagnostics in the same fashion as the Schirmer test works. So based on the wet air of the strip uh, that is worn for like five minutes, uh, we know if the person has a sufficient or insufficient reproduction. The same could be done here based on the level of the, spi on the spiral turn, for example, that the tear reaches when, the, uh, the is, um, when somebody wears the lens. Uh, of course, the lens features an inlet in the back side and uh, the channel in the other side, so tears can enter from the eye directly during wear. Uh, of course, with this method, we can obtain different structures. For example, here I'm showing some valves, which are relevant uh, in terms of microfluidic uh, for ha handling fluids. So if you want to lower the, flu flu velo lower the fluid velocity or block a fluid from uh, going forward in a certain area of the channel. Uh, the applications of this technology are on eye fluid analysis, for example. Uh, so tears can flow in these channels and reach different sensing areas where some sensors are deposited, in, in this case, colorimetric sensors. We did it with two approaches, one by depositing a very tiny amount of liquid colorimetric sensors in the sensing cavities. And this approach needs to handle the microfluidics really well, like to, to master it in order to avoid backflow or leakage. And this is an, another way to reduce a little bit those risks um, by using paper facilitated flow uh, within the channel. The inlet is, is on the backside as usual. And then an, another lens is used to bond, uh, is bonded on the top to close the channels. The readout can be performed using smartphones to read out the color. And the channels will be filled in 1.5 seconds approximately. 
So here we can see the sensors that we usually plot in this CIE diagram. We'll see later for the readout. So we can see this characterization. And the readout was based on the nearest neighbor model, which basically works by, um, by calibrating the uh, software with specific colors. So let's say three values of pH, for example, with three different colors. And uh, that the software knows they are plotted, for example, here, here, and here in these three points. When the user takes a photo of their own sensors, for example, this one, let's say for pH, um, for pH, the software basically automatically plots this new point in this diagram, and uh, then it outputs the the nearest neighbor which is like the ne the nearest calibration point so it will say the ph is eight so we know that there is an error margin but we know that this method is reliable for discriminating between discrete point this is calibration point the upwards at follow so welcome window then insert name the main menu where the user upload their image or take a photo here we uploaded this image uh, here and we selected the sensor on the top left, the one I indicated here for pH, and selected pH. Here it is possible to select which sensor we are referring to, and then it outputs your pH is 7.2. There are two more windows with me uh, the medical history, so previous measurements of the same patient, and healthy values uh, as a standard reference. The idea is that this result could be sent, could be sent to, a, to a doctor in real time, for example. That's all. Uh, if you are interested in this or if you want to chat more or uh, whatever, you can write to me by email or uh, write in, in my Twitter. And also you can visit my blog if you want, where I discuss the latest finding in this diagnostics. Thank you. I will give the word back to Roban. Hi again, everyone. Uh, thank you, Rosalia, for, uh, for this very interesting talk. So guys, as we said at the beginning of the, of the session, now is the Q&A session, so if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them in the chat box. We'll read them and uh, we'll try to answer them as best as possible. So uh, first question from uh, Ishita. Uh, with respect to spiral-shaped microfluidic contact lens, how do we real-time monitor detect if the lens has the required amount of tear collected? Uh, how it will detect if, if there is the right, the right amount of tear collected? Is this yeah, how, how can we detect in real time whether the lens has required the correct amount of tears? Ah, okay. So with this, we, we didn't uh, went, went through that, but uh, it will be relatively feasible, like relatively easy to build an app that has like the the standard shape of, of the lens as a reference, for example, with the channel, and then it recognizes where the liquid is filled up and, and says, for example, yes or no. Like, uh, I, mm, yeah, in the next step, I imagine something like that will be feasible. But yeah, good question, thank you. Another question from uh, Salma, nice presentation. I was wondering with a uh, paper microfluidic device, what paper did you use? Uh, it was like a ce cellulose paper, which is so is the same one that is used. Um, I think it is called grade one filter paper, and uh, it is the same one that they use for um, making lateral flow assays. So those like paper sensors. Wattman filter paper. What? Wattman filter paper. Ah, Wattman. Yeah, exactly that one. Yeah, Wattman filter paper, grade one. Mm -mm. Ishita helped me. Amazing. All right. Well, I guess thank you everyone for your time. Um, if you again, feel free to contact us if needed. And, uh, and thank you again, Rosalia, for your time as well. And uh, I wish you a very good day. And uh, thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot, Roman. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>